Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the protein kinase C pathway. Okay, right, so we've just gone through all of the 16 different genes for alpha subunits that are within the human genome. Okay, what we now want to look at is the diversity of the beta subunits and also the gamma subunits within heterotrimeric G proteins so that we've got a complete picture. Okay, and then we'll move forward with our pathway. Okay, so let's turn our attention to beta subunits next. Okay, so in the case of beta subunits, there are uh, five genes, okay, but then there are six actual subunits. So this doesn't surprise us anymore. What we know must have happened is one of those genes, one of those five genes, must have two splice variants, which is how we've ended up with six different known subunits, even though we've only got five known genes. Okay, so the name of the genes then is the G-beta-1, G-beta-2, G-beta-3, G-beta-4, and then G beta 5. Okay, now G beta 1, G beta 2, G beta 3, and G beta 4, they all have a single splice variant, so they only code for a single protein. So the G beta 1 gene will make the G beta 1 protein, the G beta 2 gene will make the G beta 2 protein, the G beta 3 gene will make the G beta 3 protein, and the G beta 4 gene will make the G beta 4 protein. Meanwhile, G beta 5 has two separate splice variants. So it can make two different uh, proteins, basically, and this takes us up to six different beta subunits. So it can make the G beta 5 5 uh, subunit, and then it can also make the G beta 5 L beta subunit. So that now gives us six separate beta subunits that you can use when making a heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so we've seen 21 different alpha subunits. We only looked at the genes for those, but there are 21 different alpha subunits. There are now six different beta subunits, so there is a huge scope for creating a vast plethora of heterotrimeric G proteins. Now moving on to the gamma subunits. Okay, there are 12 genes for gamma subunits. Okay. And then there are only actually 12 subunits that are gamma subunits. So this one, in this case, we um, don't know of any gamma genes that have multiple splice variants. Okay, right. So the naming is very, very simple with one little blip in the naming system. Okay, so there is the G gamma 1, the G gamma 2, okay, and it goes all the way up to G gamma 5. Okay, then there is no G gamma 6. This is the little blip in the naming system. So you then go on straight on to G gamma 7, and then uh, you have to go all the way up then to G gamma 13 rather than G gamma 12 because we've missed one out. And that will overall give us 13 different gamma subunits. So there is a G gamma 1, a G gamma 2, a G gamma 3, a G gamma 4, a G gamma 5. There's then a G gamma 7, a G gamma 8, a G gamma 9, a G gamma 10, a G gamma 11, a G gamma 12, and then finally a G gamma 13. And that gives us 12 different genes for gamma subunits, which then all code for a single protein, and therefore we end up with 12 gamma subunits. Right, so we now have a vast plethora of different alpha, beta, and gamma subunits to build heterotrimeric G proteins out of. Now, in the ideal world, when naming heterotrimeric G proteins, people would tell you exactly which alpha subunit they have in them, exactly which beta subunit they have in them, and exactly which gamma subunit they have in them. So, for example, uh, here's an example. You would say G alpha I1. So that shows us that in our heterotrimeric G protein, the alpha subunit is alpha I1. Then we could have beta 1, and then let's say also gamma 1. Okay, this would label up a heterotrimeric G protein, and it tells us exactly which alpha subunit, exactly which beta subunit, and exactly which gamma subunit the heterotrimeric G protein has within it. P 
people hardly ever actually know this sort of information, okay? Usually they don't have a clue what the beta and the gamma subunits specifically are. It's rare that they even know exactly which alpha subunit they're using, but let's assume that for now they know exactly which alpha subunit they're on about. They would then label the heterotrimeric G protein by which alpha subunit, so they might call this a GI1. However, as I said, the alpha I1, alpha I2, and alpha I3 almost do identical things. Their pharmacological profile, i.e. how drugs interact with them, are almost identical. So often people don't actually know which specific alpha I they're talking about, okay? So they might just put GI to mean it's one of them. Okay, and often, you know, uh, it might be all three of them do the same thing, basically, so it's not uh, sensical to distinguish exactly which one we're talking about. Okay, now, even worse, often people don't actually know even that sort of information. Generally, what they'll give you is they'll tell you which family the alpha subunit is in. So they might call this a GI slash naught to tell you that the alpha subunit is in the family of G alpha I naught uh, alpha subunits. Okay, right. So when I say that uh, my G protein coupled receptor is going to interact with a GQ slash 11 heterotrimeric G protein, what that means is that the alpha subunit of this heterotrimeric G protein will be in the family G alpha Q slash 11. Okay? So it will be one of these four. Now they all do pretty much exactly the same thing and they're all capable of activating the protein kinase C pathway. So that's what I mean when I say GQ slash 11. I don't know what beta gamma subunit I'm talking about. All I know is that the alpha subunit is one of these four. Okay, right. So let's now continue on with the pathway then. So let's continue drawing it here. So we'll just put our heterotrimeric, our, our G protein coupled receptor rather back here. Okay, and we'll now discuss the G protein cycle. Okay, so here is our G protein coupled receptor here. Here is the amino terminus here. And then here is the carboxylic acid terminus here. Okay, and then we'll draw the heterotrimeric G protein that's currently in the inactive state over here. So remember the heterotrimeric G protein consists of an alpha subunit and then the beta gamma complex. So here is the alpha subunit. And this will now be uh, an alpha subunit in the family Q slash 11, so I'll put Q slash 11 there. Okay, and it's got GDP bound to it at the moment because it's in the off state. And then of course it's got that lipid moiety attaching it to the inner leaf foot of the phospholipid bi there. And currently it's attached to the beta gamma complex here, which consists of a beta subunit, and we won't, we don't know, neither do we really care uh, what the beta subunit specifically is, and we don't know specifically what the gamma subunit is either. So we'll just put beta gamma there, okay? And uh, then you've got the lipid moiety coming off the gamma subunit as well. So let's add a bit of color onto our picture here. Okay, so we'll have the alpha subunit again in red here, and remember this is an alpha Q slash 11 family alpha subunit. We'll have the beta subunit in blue over here, and then we'll have the gamma subunit in green on the end. Right, okay, what's going to happen then is the ligand is going to come in and activate the G protein coupled receptor. Okay, what will then happen is you'll get a conformational change in these intracellular loops of the G protein coupled receptor that mean that the G protein coupled receptor can now bind to alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. Now, the a G protein coupled receptor will have certain alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins that it likes to bind to. Okay, so it doesn't just bind to any old alpha subunit. It has its favorites, basically. So the G protein coupled receptor that we are dealing with here is one that likes interacting with alpha Q slash 11 family G alpha subunits. Okay, uh, so those 
uh, receptors that I gave as examples, the histamine 1 receptor, the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor 1, and the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor 3. Um, what other examples did I give? The alpha 1 adrenergic receptors. All of these like to interact with heterotrimeric G proteins, which have as their alpha subunit a G alpha Q slash 11 family alpha subunit. Okay, so what's now going to happen then is the alpha subunit is going to bind to the intracellular loops of the G protein coupled receptor. So to show this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip my G protein coupled receptor around 180 degrees. So effectively, I'm just going to rotate it around like that so that the carboxylic acid terminal is on this side and the amino terminal is on the other side. All I'm doing that for is so that the carboxylic acid terminal doesn't get in the way of my picture. So it's just artistic license that I'm using now. Okay, right. So here is our... Is that got enough? No, that's not got enough. It needs seven. Okay, well here is our G protein coupled receptor again. Here's the carboxy terminus of the uh, polypeptide, and here's the amino terminus. The ligand has now bound to it, and it's activated it. So now what's happened is the alpha subunit is going to come and bind in here, and this is an alpha Q slash 11 family G alpha subunit. Okay, so I'll put that here, alpha Q slash 11. Now, a very important point is that the alpha Q slash 11 subunit can only bind to the intracellular aspect of the G protein coupled receptor if it has a beta gamma complex bound to it. If it doesn't have the beta gamma complex, it can't bind to the G protein coupled receptor. That's really important. So the beta gamma complex isn't actually involved in binding to the G protein coupled receptor itself, but without a beta gamma complex bound to the alpha subunit, the alpha subunit cannot bind to the G protein coupled receptor. Now that ensures that only alpha subunit which are in the off state will actually bind to the G protein coupled receptor because only off state alpha subunits have uh, a beta gamma complex bound to them. Okay, so here is the guanosine diphosphate bound to the alpha Q slash 11 subunit. And then here we have the beta subunit with the gamma subunit in the beta gamma complex here. Okay, and then I've still got those lipid moieties here and here. Now, what will happen is when the intracellular loops bind to the alpha Q slash 11 uh, alpha subunit of this heterotrimeric G protein, it will catalyze the release of the guanosine diphosphate from the alpha Q slash 11 subunit and the binding of a guanosine triphosphate molecule to that alpha Q slash 11 uh, subunit. Now, when GTP binds to the alpha Q slash 11 subunit, that turns this alpha subunit on, okay? And when it turns on, it no longer binds to the beta gamma complex. So the beta gamma complex is going to be released from the alpha subunit. Now, of course, what happens as soon as the alpha subunit you loses the beta gamma complex is that it can no longer bind to the intracellular aspect of the G protein coupled receptor. So it then, it is also released. So both of them are going to go off and float around the bottom of the cell membrane, basically. So let's draw this here. So we don't need to draw the G protein coupled receptor anymore. That's done its job now. What we have now got is this activated alpha subunit that is within the G alpha Q slash 11 family of alpha subunits. Okay, and it's currently in the on state, so it's got guanosine triphosphate bound to it. And then we've also got the beta gamma complex here. Okay, so here is the beta subunit, here is the gamma subunit. So once again, I'll color everything in. So the beta subunit is in blue here, the gamma subunit is in green, and then we'll have the alpha subunit in red. Okay, right. And now what's going to happen is these are going to go and interact with targets then. Okay. Uh, and we'll discuss the specific targets in a moment, but for now I'm just giving the general principles of the G protein uh, cycle. 
So okay, so let's have target one here, and that label is completely in the way. So I'm sort of going to go through it because I don't want to draw it really thin like that. Okay, so ignore that label in the middle there. This is target one, and it's the target for the alpha uh, Q slash eleven subunit, and we'll come on to what this target one actually is in a moment. And then you'll also have a target for the beta gamma complex, and you'll have multiple targets, but just to get the principle across. Here is target 2. Okay, so what happens is the beta gamma complex goes and interacts with target 2 here, causes some change in target 2, and then the alpha subunit is also going to go and interact with some target, target 1 here, and it will cause some change in target 1. However, the important thing to note, and what people often forget, is not only does the alpha subunit cause a change in target 1, but target 1 will also cause a change in the alpha subunit. It's going to activate the enzymic activity of the alpha subunit. Now, you might be thinking, what? The alpha subunit is an enzyme? Yes, it is. It's an enzyme that can break down GTP, guanosine triphosphate, into guanosine diphosphate and an inorganic phosphate. So basically, it's capable of hydrolyzing GTP down to GDP and an inorganic phosphate. So it is, in fact, a GTPase enzyme. Okay. Now, basically, when it binds to its target, what will happen is it will activate or inactivate or do something to the target, but the target will also activate the GTPase activity of the alpha subunit, and then what the alpha subunit will do is it will hydrolyze the GTP down to GDP, then what will happen is the GDP will remain bound to the alpha subunit, whilst the inorganic phosphate will be released into the cytoplasm. Now the alpha subunit has turned itself off effectively. It will then cleave away from its target because it can only bind to its target when it's in the on state. Okay, so it'll cleave away from target one, and it will then go back crying to the beta gamma complex over here, and it will snatch the beta gamma complex off target two, and then it will reform the heterotrimeric G protein up here that's in the off state. Whoops, you can't see that. Okay, and this is why it's a cycle, basically. So this is what's known as the G protein cycle. Okay, right. So we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video, what we'll do is we'll actually see what this target one is. We're not going to talk about target two in this video. We're only going to talk about what the alpha Q slash 11 uh, subunit is going to do once it's got GTP bound to it and is in the on state. Okay, see you then.